to our Heavenly Father in prayer one more time this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we are able to gather here this Lord's Day. We thank you that we get to come together, have already sang your word, have read your word, have prayed your word, and now, Lord, we turn and prepare for the preaching of your word. Father, Lord, we understand and know that we are not the only local church gathered here this morning in this city or even around the world. Father, Lord, we want to uh, pray for our sister church in the area, Temple Baptist. Father, Lord, we pray uh, for them as they are gathered. Father, Lord, we pray that your word is faithfully proclaimed there, that the saints and the body of Christ are built up and edified there, that your name may be furthered there. Father, Lord, we also want to pray for uh, our IMB missionaries around the world. We want to pray for those that are, are laboring in southern Europe. Father, Lord, many of these countries, Lord, have those fleeing from uh, persecution, in, especially from northern Africa and the Middle East. Father, Lord, we want to pray for our southern European missionaries who are faithful faithfully laboring in these refugee camps to get the gospel out to those that may have never heard had it not been for them fleeing to these camps. Father, Lord, we pray that you will protect our missionaries and help them to continue to be bold in declaring the gospel there. Lord, help them to love and care for the people there that are hurting and minister well to them. Lord, we pray for churches to be built up in, in the southern Europe, Lord, where these refugees are faithfully able to gather where, where others are faithfully able to gather to hear your word proclaimed each and every Lord's Day. Father, Lord, we pray that you will be faithful to grow the gospel there. Lord, as we also pray that you will do here this morning. Father, Lord, as we continue to face challenges of a global pandemic, also, Lord, we want to lift this to you. Lord, we do not want to be moved and controlled by fear. We want to be wise and good stewards of what you have given us. We want to use wisdom, Lord, that is found in you of, of loving one another, Lord, as even we have uh, encouraged this morning, Lord. Help us to love one another well in this church, and Lord, help our city to love one another uh, in this pandemic, Lord. Help us to not be selfish and only look out for our interest, our own, our own good, but to the interest and good of our neighbors around us. Lord, even thinking of how we uh, bear witness to others who are watching by how we handle these situations. Lord, help us to have wisdom in that. Help us to honor you well in it. Lord, now as we get ready to open your word, Father, I pray that you will uh, quiet our hearts, still our minds, so that we may hear from you. Lord, help me get out of the way as the preacher and be simply the messenger to preach your word that you have for all of us here this morning. Would you move in our hearts? Would you encourage us where we need encouraging? Would you rebuke us where we need rebuking? Would you stir us where we need stirring? Will you move powerfully through your spirit this morning and the proclamation of your word? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As I was preparing and thinking about the text this morning and what kind of story paints in well, I couldn't help but think of the, the story of the tortoise and the hare. A very familiar story. We all know that the hare starts out well. He gets so far ahead and then begins to stop, to congratulate, to pat himself on the back, and the tortoise keeps slowly going keeps slowly catching up. Then the, the hare has to run again. And the tortoise catches up because the hare once again thinks they're prideful, and, or he thinks he's prideful and he stops. And again, the tortoise catches up. Long story short, it's the tortoise that wins the race. No matter how fast and how far ahead the hare got, each time he would stop because he thought he was in good shape to win. Much like that, we often think of the Christian life. How we start fast and hard and strong. We think what controls us as Christians. 
But brothers and sisters, what I want to talk to us this morning, what our text points us to, is that it's no race of the hare for the Christian life. We need to be more like the tortoise, slow and steady and finish. That's what our text shows us this morning, and that's what I want to talk to us about. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Colossians chapter 1. We'll be finishing chapter 1 and moving into chapter 2 this morning. But just kind of etching us back up just so we can get that running start as we enter our text. We've been looking at Paul and Timothy are writing this letter to a local church, the church of Colossae. Paul nor Timothy founded this church. It was founded by Epaphras. Epaphras had brought them the gospel and faithfully proclaimed it there because he had heard the gospel from Paul and it bore fruit in his life, so he went and took it to others. And the Colossians have had the same fruit bearing in them. And it had already brought them to salvation. They're being reminded, this is the hope that you have that's already laid up for you in the gospel, which you've heard, which you have believed. Hold to this. Remember it. May it continue producing fruit in your lives. And then last week, we, we looked at that great hymn of Colossians 1, 15 through 23, of seeing the richness, the supremacy of who Jesus is, that he is sufficient, he is above all, and in him alone our salvation comes. So that's where we pick up this morning. Hear the word of the Lord from Colossians 1, beginning in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, And for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. If I have understood this text rightly as I've studied this week, the main point of the text, and therefore the main point of this sermon, if I'm doing this whole preaching thing correctly, giving you the main point of the text, and not my idea, not my opinion, it is this. Christian, if we are to stand firm and grow to maturity in the faith, then we must labor to fill up the afflictions of Christ in laboring for one another's good. Let me say that again. Christian, if we are to stand firm and grow to maturity in the faith, then we must labor to fill up the afflictions of Christ in laboring for one another's good. And I'll unfold this in two points. A mature and firm faith and filling the afflictions of Christ. So let's look at this first point a mature and firm faith. Look here back at verse 21, it says, or 28, him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This this is Paul's aim summed up here in this verse, along with 2.5, which goes on to say, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Paul is laboring so the church of Colossae can stand firm, that they can reach maturity. This is his whole aim of writing this letter. He wants to see this church stand firm, to hold fast until the end. The same needs to be true of us. 
This is the same that is true of, of Lord willing, my ministry to help us all to reach the end of our race, to stand firm in faith, to be mature. But what does this idea of maturity tell us? We see this a little bit back in 23 to kind of set the stage again. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. The call is, if indeed you hold fast, is, is kind of the setting stage for this idea of maturity. So, so the word that underlies the, this word mature from the English Standard Version, which also the NIV uses and uh, the King James Bible as well uses this translation mature. But the Greek word is teleon, and it's actually got a wide range of meanings. It can mean mature. So mature is a right translation. But it also, or no, the King James actually says perfect, and one says complete, which is the New American Standard Bible. So let me kind of give you why I don't think it's mature, why I also don't think the King James is right in saying that it's perfect. The mature, the idea then would mean that we're comparing ourselves to one another, which Paul does not use in the context here. He's not comparing uh, a maturity with anything else. If he was using this word in a way of showing mature, it would be, okay, this is immature, this is mature. But he's not doing that, you see, in the context. He's saying, if you stand firm, if you hold fast, it's an if then. But the maturity is not a level. The danger for us, if we think this is simply a maturity, is that we want to compare ourselves as Christians to one another. Brother and sister in Christ, if you're looking to compare your maturity to the brother or sister sitting in front of you, behind you, next to you, we've already missed the point of this text. Because our maturity, our salvation, isn't dependent upon the person next to us. It's in standard to Christ himself. That's the standard, not one another. So I think that's one danger of us thinking this is the idea of maturity. But it also can't be this idea of perfect either. Because then the danger is I can be up here and think, you know, I've got this Christian life figured out. I've come to perfection this is, is one danger that floats around that somehow we can reach a perfection of faith. And that's not the case. Paul's not saying that. He said, if you hold fast. So how can he mean anything of reaching a perfection? That's not what he's communicating here. And that, this is the reason I think the New American Standard Bible has this correct in, in a completeness. It's bringing it to an end, to a finish to finishing the race, just like the tortoise beat the hare because he finished the race. Christian, this is the aim of maturity. It's a call to endure, a call to finish our run with Christ. It's not a call to compare ourselves, but a call to finish the race. This is what we need. We see this again in, in 2, 3 through 5 in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. This is why this is about endurance. It doesn't matter how well we start the Christian life. We can start fast and strong that we can end up falling away. Even in the last year or two, we've seen many well-known Christians fall away from their faith. One being Joshua Harris. He was well thought of by so many for so long in his faith. And yet now he has denied the faith. We prayed that the Lord would bring such a man as that to himself to return but maybe this sits even a little closer to home. Maybe you're sitting here this morning that you started well and fast and strong in your Christian faith, but now you're struggling to hold on. Or maybe even worse, you're denying the faith. Or maybe this is your child or, or family member, brother, sister, loved one, friend, 
who started so well in their Christian faith and has fallen away. It doesn't matter how well they started. It doesn't matter how well we start. The call of the Christian life is one to hold fast to the hope of the gospel, to endure until the very end, to complete the race. Yes, it brings with it knockdowns. It brings with us pitfalls that we fall into. We still struggle with sin. We still have not reached perfection, which is, again, why it can't be the idea of perfection. But we endure. We keep rising back up because we have a hope that's greater in Christ. You know, Dakota likes to give me a hard time about Tennessee football. And I reminded, my hope's not in Tennessee football because Tennessee football has failed me for way too long. (laughs) And I admit that. But our hope is in Christ. And Christ is seated on the throne. He's still reigning forever and ever more. That's why we endure. We endure because we set our eyes on Him. It's Him who brings us the riches of full assurance here as we even see in our text. Back in 24 and 25, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now here in 26, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of this glorious of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And even down in in verse 2 and 3, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The biggest way we endure until the end is by setting our eyes on Christ. First, remembering that it is Christ in us who's at work. You know, Darcy and I have been married for for a little over two years, and what was hers is now mine, and what was mine is now hers. We, We are united together as a couple. And this, brothers and sisters, is the same language that we have in Christ. We are united to Christ, and what is his is ours. That means the kingdom is ours. That means we will be with him in his kingdom when he makes it all new again. The riches of his sonship, we have been adopted with Christ, that we are now fellow heirs with Christ. All that is with Christ is now ours. We inherit it all as his fellow heirs. How do we reach completion? How do we finish the race? By keeping our eyes set on Jesus. We run the race faithful by keeping our eyes on the call of the upward prize, which is Christ in us. We need to see that it is to Christ we have been called. It is to Christ that we follow. Christian, are you holding to Christ to complete your race? Are you trusting the day you walked down an aisle or were baptized? If you're trusting in that, It will fail you. I promise. I was almost there. But it's in Christ. We see his beauty, his glory. And we keep enduring, reminding that we are united to him. But it's also the fact that we have this reminder, as I read a few weeks ago in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, which says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We remember not only are we in Christ, but it is Christ's yoke that has been given to us, which is light and easy. He's not giving us an impossible or heavy burden, but he has bore the load on himself. He was pierced for our transgressions and our sins. He has made it so that we could be transferred from the kingdom and domain of darkness to the kingdom of light, to his kingdom. This is in Christ, and we have this great rest. And we can rest in him. Oh, 
Taste how sweet that is, brother and sister. We have rest in our King, in our Savior. This is how we keep pressing on. We endure because we have a Savior who has loved us so. We endure because we keep our eyes on Jesus. But Christ has not left it to just us to do this. One, he is at work within us, but he has also given us here this body of believers to labor together. And that's where we turn in our second point this morning, filling the afflictions of Christ. Going back to 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. First, we have to deal with this idea that Paul's rejoicing because of sufferings. One, we often don't think about, I'm rejoicing in my sufferings. But Paul's saying, I'm rejoicing that I'm suffering for the sake of the body, the church. He suffers because of what he's laboring for. And we'll come back to this in a moment. What about this filling up the afflictions that are lacking in Christ? Some of you may be sitting here and, wait a minute, Kyle, didn't you just say the last two weeks that Christ is sufficient? Yeah, I did. And I still hold by that. Paul is not telling us there's anything lacking in Christ for our salvation. It is in Christ and Christ alone our hope is found. He alone is sufficient to save us. It is his work alone that saves. But think about the moment you came to hear the gospel. Who told you? Who discipled you? A dear brother by the name of Clip Suddeth led me to the gospel. He discipled me through and through. He has walked by my side and is still one of the first ones I turned to as a mentor. It was because he suffered for the sake of me that I heard the gospel. This is what it means by suffering and feeling what is lacking in Christ. It's those that go and proclaim the gospel so that others can hear. It's laboring for the good of one another. This is what we do each Sunday as we gather We are gathering together to feel the afflictions of Christ as we further the gospel, as we further God's word, making it fully known so that we may be built up by it. Have you thought about that, brother and sister? Have you thought about you sitting in the pews have as much responsibility as I do standing up here to labor for the good of one another? Have you thought about that you have a responsibility to each member of this local church to speak truth into one another, to build one another up, to encourage one another. This is what we have been called to do. And that's what Paul here, in 129, he says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul toiled. He labored for the good of the church. He labored for the good of fellow believers so that they could reach that maturity, so that they could stand firm. This is what we want to be here at Central City Baptist Church. We want to labor so that others may stand firm as well, so that we may build one another up. Jonathan Lehman, in his book, Compelling Community, writes this, Encouragement is an antidote to unbelief. To encourage means to strengthen each other's faith. It means being merciful to those who doubt. It means helping each other hold the shield of faith. A commitment to encourage is a commitment to fight for faith together. This is the fight for faith before us. Brothers and sisters, before you leave today, spend some time encouraging a fellow believer who might be struggling. Maybe you don't know where they're at. Encourage them, remind them of the hope that they have is in Christ. Build them up. May this constantly define us as a church that we labor to encourage one another, to build one another up instead of tearing down. Maybe you think we don't need encouragement. Paul Tripp adds this in his book, Lead. 
He said, no one is spiritually mature that he is free from a need for the comfort, warnings, encouragement, rebuke, instruction, and insight of others. Everyone needs partners in struggles. Everyone needs to be helped to see what they cannot see about themselves on their own. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 goes on to say, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider, consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Christian, we are to do this each Sunday as we gather. This is why we gather. This is why it's important to be here as we gather. Of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. This looks differently right now. But as soon as this is over, we need to be about them gathering together on Sunday morning to hear the preaching of the word so that we can be knit together, so that we can be encouraged, so that we can press onward in our Christian faith. This is the way it's always been. Why is the church gathered to encourage one another, to stir one another? We carry, as Central City Baptist Church, we carry out the one another's of Scripture more practically here together than we do with the others outside. Why? Because we've covenanted together, we've joined together as members of this body to work together, to strive together, to toil together. One member is not more important than the other. I'm not more important than any one of you. We labor together for the good of one another. Maybe you're thinking, somebody's difficult to love. How can I love this person? Don Carson kind of ruins this for us. In his book, Love in Hard Places, he says, Ideally, the church itself is not made up of natural friends. It is made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common ancestry, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. In this light, they are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. Christian, we're called to love one another for the sake of Christ. We're called to encourage one another for the sake of Christ. So, we, we need to encourage one another. We need to stir one another. We need to build one another. But how are we doing on this loving end? Do we see this need to love one another well? If there's strife, if there's jealousy, if there's envy amongst us, it will divide and kill and destroy. How do we see each other in this church? Brothers and sisters, if any of this describes you and you have conflict with another brother or sister in this church, I'd plead with you. Work through this conflict. Work through it so that we can love one another well. We will not stand without one another and we need to love one another to stand together so that Satan may not pull us away. We have an enemy who wants to kill and destroy. He wants to divide so that the watching world may be hindered from coming to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what is charged before us. We're called to love one another. That great chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 is a chapter of love. It's not about a marriage. It's about a, it is, but not the sense of between a husband and wife but about a body of believers, a local church in Corinth. And the same applies to us here at Central City Baptist Church. Let us love one another well and labor for one another's sake. The Apostle Paul is a great model of this. He's a great example. He labored and poured himself out for the local church of Colossae. He did it for churches of Galatia and Corinth and Ephesus and on and on. He gave his life as an offering to build up the church. What are we doing? Are we pouring ourselves out for this sake? I pray that we will. We need to see, as we move onward, that we're called to love and to labor for each other's good as the church. We do this not by our own strength, but because Christ is in us. Look back with me 
up to verses 24, and then I'll drop down to 29. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. He works through that, and then back in 29, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Yes, we need to be about this, but it's not our own strength that will bring us to this. It's Christ and the power of the Spirit that is work within us that will enable us to do this. So how do we love one another? By drawing near to God through his word each and every week, daily opening our Bibles, daily drawing near to Christ and being filled with his Spirit that will work within us if we will humble ourselves and call out to his knowledge for his wisdom and how to do this. Just one more last quick practical application. As we think about how we can love one another and build one another up, one, find different people to spend time with. Each Sunday as you you come in here, don't connect with the same ones. Try and connect with different people. That way you can know one another. Spend some time, even as you go throughout the month, and and Lord willing, this week I'm going to get a prayer calendar where I have each of you, where I pray for four or five of you each day of the month and regularly going to be doing that as my habit. I want to encourage us as a church to do the same. Pray for one another. That's how you grow in love for one another. Pray for each other. Spend time. Maybe you don't know exactly what to pray. Pray some of the prayers of Paul for one another. Pray the prayer that we looked at in Colossians 1, 3 through 14. Pray that prayer for one another. Thank God for each other. Pray for spiritual upbringing and building up and growing in faith. Pray that we hold fast. Other ways, we love one another, even as I mentioned in the announcements this morning. We try and encourage everyone to wear a mask. That's one way of loving each other in this hard season. I don't like this mask. But if I can love and protect somebody in this congregation by wearing it, by when I sneeze at not going over them and and airborne particles, you know what? That sounds pretty good, that I can love you by doing that. Yeah, it enters me. I don't like it. It it causes glasses to fog. If that's the inconvenience I can have to love others, we think of that. And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty if you've not, but it's, this is an example of ways we love one another. We love one another by giving up our own freedoms, our own rights for the sake of each other. You know, there's going to be certain songs we sing in this church I will not like as pastor. But like I told you when you interviewed and had the question and answer, I'm going to sing because it builds up you all. It builds up the body. It's not about me. It's about us as a whole. This is how we love one another well. Let us love one another well because Christ has first loved us. We are unworthy of that love. We were filthy when Christ died on a cross for us. For he died for us while we were still sinners. Should we not love then one another in the same way he has loved us, in particular those that we are covenanted together with as those at Central City Baptist Church. One last thing. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe you don't know this gospel. Maybe you've sat through here and and wondering, what does this all have to do with me? Because a Savior bled and died. He stood condemned in our place that we may live. If this is you, repent and turn to Christ. Come to Jesus Because this same inheritance, this same promise, can be yours. Do not harden your hearts while it is still today. For you never know when that heart may finally harden and you ultimately and forever reject the gospel. If this is you, if I'm describing a family member, go and proclaim this gospel. A friend, go and proclaim the same gospel you have heard today so that we can love a dying world who needs the gospel. Let us fill up the afflictions of Christ in these ways. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we have been able to gather here this morning to hear from your word. Lord, we pray that we will be a church that is marked and characterized by our love for you and our love for one another. Father, Lord, I pray uh, that there is no conflict. I pray that there is no tension. But Lord, let us be weary of growing complacent, or cautious of growing complacent and growing weary in that. Let us that not set in. Or if in moments of calmness we need to remember these warnings so that we do not fall into them. Or keep us from complacency and always striving to grow in godliness, to grow in our love for you and others. God, we pray as we go out from this place, Lord, that we would declare these things to a lost and dying world, that we would labor for the good of one another and labor for those who have yet to even hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, be with us, strengthen us, empower us by your spirit. Lord, we pray and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.